Hey, Robot Makers, how you doing? I hope you're having a good week and day so far. <laughs> Nearly choked on that then. <laughs> so do you want to know how to use inverse kinematics to position your robot arms and limbs and legs uh, and use Python and MicroPython with that as well? Then this is the show for you. So let's dive straight in. My name's Kevin. Come with me as we build robots and bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. Right, let me get over to my keynote. Cool. So yes, this is all about inverse kinematics. And uh, I was quite inspired to look at this by um, the robot uh, that Alex Flom had created, which is the one that you can see on the screen there, which is this one I've got over here, just on the desk, uh, Tico. And this is my flavor of that Tico Pico. And uh, I was trying to figure out and reverse engineer the code that was written for this, which I think was originally written for uh, Plot Clock which is what this was based on. And it's quite an interesting mechanism because it has this sort of end effect to where you put the pen and you have your two servos that sort of move around to a position where the pen will be on the canvas. And this was sort of really stumbling in my knowledge. I was trying to figure out how to make this thing work um, rather than just using the code that was written because the code that was written was written in Arduino, first of all, and I wanted to use MicroPython. And all the values for the servos were sort of adjusted so they were actually the pulse widths that you send to the servo rather than the angle. And that was just flummoxing me because on MicroPython, you have a value when you put in pulse widths between zero and 65,000. It's like two bytes. It's a 16 digit number. Uh, whereas on the um, Arduino, um, it's a number between, um, I think it's 550 and 2500 for the between zero and 180 degrees. So trying to figure that out and seeing all these sort of arbitrary values in the code uh, really didn't lend itself to sort of a teachable moment to how to figure out inverse kinematics for other robots. And there's a secret project I've been involved with that involves the, the exactly this kind of mechanism for placing a foot on the ground and making the foot position and walk. And I hadn't been able to get involved in that until I'd figured this out. So this show is quite useful to me too. So let's get into this. It's an essential robot maker skill. If you need, if you want to build robots and you want to make them walk in a more elegant way than just uh, arbitrary moving servos like that, you want to figure out where to put the, the end effect to the limb, then this is the show for you. So let's deep dive into inverse kinematics using Python to solve the angles. We're going to look at what forward kinematics is, what inverse kinematics is, a bit of trigonometry, and then we're going to solve the angles step by step with some Python example code. And then we'll do a bit of a demo as well using Google Colab. So it'll be quite a fun show. So last week we looked at Pico Tico, uh, the tic-tac-toe playing robot. And that can draw a game board, it can play tic-tac-toe, it can raise the board, but it does all this in the background by placing that pen, that end effector, on a canvas and then just adjusting the two servos to position where that pen is. So I really, really want to f figure this out and share this with you. So last week we, we saw this diagram, we touched on inverse kinematics, we simply said it means that you can focus on where you want the pen to be on the canvas and we use some functions to work out where each of the servo positions can be to achieve that and it's simple trigonometry. Simple trigonometry that if I'm honest was really confusing me. I think I was off high school that day when they clearly went over this. So let's have a deep dive into this today. So what is forward and inverse kinematics? So it's all about where you start and where you end. So this is a statement I got. Forward kinematics is a mapping function from the joint space to the Cartesian space, meaning X, Y, and the inverse kinematics is mapping from Cartesian space to joint space. So this is a better sort of diagram for that. So if we want to go from the joint angles themselves to the position X, Y, Z, we use forward kinematics. If we want to go from a X, Y position, which is what we want to do, we want to say go to X and Y with a pen and then have the formula work out what the angle should be of the servos and then we use inverse kinematics. Okay, so Pythagoras, Pythagorean theory. So we start out with a right angle triangle and we're going to label the, uh, the angles within it with a small a, small b and small c. And the sides we're going to have is large, uh, large uppercase c, uppercase a and uppercase b. So we have the hypotenuse, which is the long side. We have the adjacent, which is kind of underneath the c. And then to the left of the c is the opposite side. Let's see what I did there. So what we can say about this is that the sine of the angle x is the opposite over the hypotenuse. The cosine of x is the adjacent over the hypotenuse and the tangent of x is the opposite over the adjacent. If you remember at high school, we had this thing called Sokotoa as the mnemonic for remembering that. So this is something that we'll refer back to when we go through 
um, the code later on. It's just one of those things we need to know about. So these things call sin, cos and tan, and we'll look at what those are as well. So what on earth is, t is tangent, sine and cosine? And I think this is the piece that was missing from my understanding about angles. I was aware that you have functions on a calculator for sine, cos and tan, but I didn't really understand what they were and how they worked. So we've got this imaginary triangle. We've got an origin point right at the very beginning of, in the middle of that triangle. And then we have two axes, uh, axis. We've got Y and we have X. And then we have a line that's going from the origin point to point P. Uh, and that's currently at 45 degrees. Um, and the value of the, the radius of this circle is just going to be 1. It's going to be value 1. It might be 100 miles. It might be 100 nanometers. It's just a value of 1 for, um, for the theory. And then we've got an angle there, which is theta. So they usually use theta as a, an angle in maths just to show um, that there is an angle uh, and to differentiate it between everything else. So the tangent of theta is x times y over O to the origin times x. The sine of minus 90, um, sorry, let me start that again. The sine of 90 minus theta is the cosine of theta. The cosine of 90 minus theta is sin theta. And the cosine squared theta plus the cosine of um, the sin um, plus the sin of um, squared of, of theta is one. It's a bit of a mouthful. So really, what the way I interpret this is, if we have um, two angles x and y, in the very middle between those is the tangent ang angle that we're looking for, uh, and then we have cosine and sine, which are kind of at ninety degrees from each other. That's the way I'm remembering this and how we will use it in our formulas. So some Pythagorean theory. Again, this is going to be really useful for helping us solve triangles. We've got our ABC triangle again there. So Pythagoras figured out, or he was the first person to claim that he'd figured it out, because I believe it had been figured out way before this by other civilizations. But in a right angle triangle, the area of the square on the hypotenuse is the sum of the area of the squares on the other two sides. So C squared equals A squared plus B squared. Or another way to say that is C is the square root of A squared plus B squared. It's going to get a little bit maths heavy in this, but you can always pause it, go back and watch it again if you get stuck with this. So this is pretty simple trigonometry. This is what we meant by uh, the sort of rudimentary um, trigonometry. So we can figure out the length of one of the sides if we have the other two sides. That's what this tells us. And if we have the length of all three sides, we can also work out what the angle of each of those is as well. So that's that can really help us when we're figuring out lots of triangles later on. So here's some, our first piece of Python code. So we can say that the value of C is the square root of A star star 2. And star star simply means um, squared. So the we say square root um, C is the square root of A squared plus b squared. So that's how we write squares. You could create a little function that just does a times a, or you could write out a times a plus b times b, but this is a little bit more elegant, if not a little bit more cryptic. <laughs> then there's the cosine rule. So one rule to rule them all, or at least work out the value of a. So here we have that triangle again, and this time we're going to work out what the cosine of an angle is. So the sides are ABC, and we've figured out what the values of them are using uh, Pythagoras, and the angles are ABC. We can use the cosine rule to work out the value of an angle uh, using the known values of the sides. So this is what we use for that. So A squared equals B squared plus C squared minus 2 times B times C. Uh, and then it, that's the, the cosine of the angle. So the way that we write that is A equals A cos, and we'll come to what that is in a minute, b squared plus c squared minus a squared divided by 2 uh, times b times c. Now, um, if you like these videos, please give it a like. Give it a like on the video if you're watching this now on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, please make a comment. Let me know what you think about this. Is it too fast? Is it too slow? Um, and also, if you're not subscribed to the channel already, definitely hit the subscribe button. That can help me out and grow the channel a little bit more. And I do a video every single um, Sunday at 7 o'clock GMT-ish. Um, by ish, I just mean depending if we're in British summertime or not. Uh, and I also try and get a midweek video out as well. Now, this thing has flummoxed me to the extent that I've not got a video out last Wednesday and I didn't get one out this Wednesday simply because I was trying to figure all this out and then put it in a, in a format that people can at least uh, access and understand and then write some code and test it. 
And it's 19th of September today, so any any points to anyone what know, that knows what that could possibly mean? What's so special about the 19th of September? Arr. It's national. <laughs> it's international Tot Like a Pirate Day. So this comes up on my home my calendar every single year, and I'm always like, is it this day? Is it is it the day after? Is it the day before? Um, so yes, today is International Tot Like a Pirate Day. Ah, my hearties, pieces of eight bit. <laughs> Anyway, let's get back to inverse kinematics. So and this is an arm with two degrees of freedom. So what we're talking about here is we've got, let me use my little example here. We have an arm. In fact, let's take off one of the pieces so that it looks a bit more like what we're talking about here. So we've simply got one, one degree of freedom and then we have the other degree of freedom there. So that's the two degrees of freedom that we've got on this little arm. Now, if we want to work out what value to set the servo to so it can position this first arm, we need to work out what the, the angle Q1 is. But to work out the angle of Q1, we will first need to work out the angle of Q2, as is always the case. And this is why it's inverse kinematics. We need to work back from that end effector. So we want to work out what the value of Q1 is so that we can set the servo. First, we must work out the value of Q2. Um, first, we can draw a triangle between the origin point, which is our X and Y, and the which is the pen tip, also known as the end effector. And then we can draw that down to the, to the, the origin point um, of X and Y. So we get this nice, simple right angle triangle. Right angle triangles mean that we can figure out what the length of that long side is the hypotenuse, uh, which we've marked on here as R. So the new triangle, we can work out the length of R. We know that the, the length of side X, as well as the length of side Y, because that is the X and Y that we put in at the very top. So using Pythagoras, we know that R is the square root of X squared plus Y squared. And using some Python code, this is R equals the square root of X um, star star two, which is the square plus the square of y as well. Okay, so that's you, you're with me so far. That's pretty straightforward. So now that we've figured out what the uh, the length of r is, we can create a new triangle. So we can go between uh, the, the length of q of uh, a1, which is that first section of our, that's the, the value of this um, here. And then we have a2, which is this one here. And we know what the, the angle, we know what the length of the side is on that triangle there. We've mapped it as r. So yes, where r is uh, the square root of x squared plus y squared. And a, a longer way of, of uh, explaining what that is, is r squared is a1, which is the length of that first arm, squared plus a2 squared, minus r squared, minus 2 times a1 times a2, and that's the cosine that we get there. So that's another way we can reduce that uh, formula down. Stick with me, it's a simpler relationship than it looks there. When I look at these maths equations, my brain does go a little bit fuzzy. So I see, I, I understand this when I look at code. And I think one of the challenges when I was looking at this is converting these kind of maths formulas and maths notation into simple Python code. So what we can say there is Q2 is simply pi minus alpha, which is the, uh, the angle that we're working out in this particular Q2. So, so what we say there is alpha is a cos which is the um, arc cosine of a1, which is the length of that first arm, time uh, squared plus a2 squared, then minus the x squared mi minus y squared, divided by two times a1 times a2. That's a real big mouthful. Shall we walk through that one more time? So we've got the length of the first section of the arm, which is a1. We're gonna square that. We're gonna then square a2, which is this second piece. We're gonna then take that away from the length of the x and the y squared, and then divide all of that by two times a times by that arm um, there, which is a two. And that will give us a cosine. So we want the arc cosine of that. Um, and then we simply say q2 is pi minus alpha, and that'll give us a result in radians. So we use arc cos or a cos when we want to know the cosine of an angle so when we know the cosine of an angle and we want to know the actual angle uh, that that is. So that kind of gives us, if we just use cos, we would get the um, the cosine, but we want the actual angle of that. So we use a cos, a cos, which is a cosine. Okay, so now that we know Q2, we can work out the length of some other areas of this triangle. So we want to know, 
if there's an imaginary line that's going past the end of here and there's another imaginary line going down at a right angle to that, that's A2 cosine Q2 and A2 sine Q2. So we can work out what those are because we know the values of Q2, which is that angle, uh, which is that angle there. And we will figure out, we know the length of A2 is there. So knowing those things, we can work out the rest of the angles that are involved. So we'll be able to solve the final triangle to find out the value of beta. Beta is the final, where this triangle goes down here, it's this little angle here. And if we know beta, we can figure out um, what Q1 will be as well. Uh, which is the servo position we're after. So the sine Q2 is the uh, square root of 1 minus the cosine of Q2 squared. Um, and we can see the code for that is simply, I've just given it a variable name which is the same, so A2 sine Q2 is the square root of 1 minus the cosine of Q2 squared. And now that we know the, the length of A1 plus A2 cosine Q2, uh, we can solve the final triangle and we can find out what the value of beta is, uh, which is the final servo position. So we've now got this new red line that we've, we've added on. Uh, because we know this A cos Q2 length, we know the value of uh, A1, we know the value of A2 sin, and we know the value of R, we can work out um, what the angle beta will be. So now that the length of A1 plus A2 cosine Q2 is known, we can solve the fin final triangle. We can find the value of beta, which in turn can provide Q1, which is the servo position we are after. So here's the math notation for that. Beta equals the inverse tangent of <laughs> A2 um, sine Q2, uh, which is over A1 plus A2 cosine of Q2. So in a bit of code, that's what this looks like. So we've got that first length of the red um, line which is a2 cos q2 so that equals a2 times by sine q2 so that's nice and simple the side length which is that red line is simply a1 which is that first value of the angle uh, of the leg uh, plus that imaginary line that's going up there which is a2 cos q2 and then beta which is the angle between this imaginary line that's coming down uh, the angle there that is simply the arc tangent of a2 sine q2 and that side length um, so it's this side length here and it's the value there as well so that, once we've got them we know what the value of beta will be and we use arc tangent 2 when we want to know the actual angle of the inverse tangent which is so if we see tan minus 1 we use uh, a tan if we see uh, cosine minus 1 it just means it's the inverse, so we just use the A to inverse it. Okay, so back to our original triangle, we can state that there is a relationship between uh, gamma and the lengths of sides X and Y. So that original triangle we had, we've now got this new angle, which is the angle between this imaginary triangle, and we've got there gamma. So gamma is the inverse tangent of Y over X. So Q1 is, is um, gamma minus beta, so we can see there we've got this uh, we've got this angle here which is our gamma, and to figure out what Q1 is, we simply need to take away what the value of beta is, and what we have left will be Q1. So Q1 is is uh, gamma minus beta. Q1 is the inverse tangent of y over x minus the inverse tangent of a2 sin Q2 uh, over a1 plus a2 cosine of Q2. It's a whole mouthful that. If you sit down and work that out, um, you will get this piece of code here, which is Q1 is the arc tangent of X and Y. Sorry, Y and X. I always get that wrong when I'm writing my code and it will spit out an error. So it's uh, it's Y and then X. Um, and then we minus that from another tangent, which is uh, A2 sin Q2 and then A1 plus A2 cosine of Q2. And that will give us the value of Q1, which is the value to set our our servo angle at. Okay, there's some terrible jokes going on in the comments. I will come back to them in a minute. <laughs> we can summarize the two equations that make up the solution to the inverse kinematic function. So these are um, Q2 is the cos the inverse cosine of x squared plus y squared minus a1 squared minus a2 squared. Remember a1 and a2 are the, the lengths of the, of the arm. And Q1 is the inverse tangent of X over Y minus the inverse tangent of A2 sin Q2 
over a1 plus a2 cosine of q2. So if we have those two pieces of code, we can figure out what the servo position should be. And there they are. So q2 is, the, is a cos, and then in brackets, a1 squared plus a2 squared minus x squared plus y, uh, minus y squared. Let me say that again, because I think that I got that wrong. q2 is a cos a1 squared plus a2 squared minus x squared minus y squared over two times a1 times uh, a2. So that's q2. And then q1 is the arctangent of y and x minus the arctangent of a sin 2 and then a plus a2 cos q2. If you've got that, there's going to be a quiz at the end of this. <laughs> you can pause this and you can go back and you can also print out all of the, uh, the slides if you want as well. So you've got these. OK, so there is another version of this. So if you think you can do that with your arm. You can also do that and get the exact same end point because it doesn't matter. So there's kind of a, a positive or a minus version of this solution. And that will always be the case when you've got uh, more than one um, degree of freedom in there. So in this scenario, uh, the Q2 is negative. So it's kind of, instead of it going that way and us figuring it out, it's now going that way. So it's now a different value. So we simply put a, a minus sign in front of the cosine that's all we need to do on there. Um, so in our code, we just do a negative um, a cos and then the rest of it. And we also need to, the Q1 also has to have a, a different uh, sign in there. So instead of minus in the two tangents, we simply plus them together. So on that second line of code there, that plus there has actually changed. That was a minus in the other one, it's now a plus. So that means there's two potential solutions when we're working out um, these degree of freedoms and we can just simply do a test to see is the value less than zero or greater than zero and then whichever you want to then pick you've got two formulas to use. So you can see that Q1 um, needs to have the A tan results added together so we've got Y, y which is the, the gamma, gamma is the inverse of X, Y over X and Q1 is therefore uh, gamma plus beta. And there's the, the more formal version of that. Q1 is the inverse of the inverse tangent of y over x plus the inverse tangent of a2 sin q2 over a1 plus a2 cosine of q2. So there's the two solutions side by side. Uh, and there's the corresponding Python code for positive and negative. Um, and you can see the maths formula there as well. It looks very fancy that I always think whenever I see that because... Um, uh, I didn't really study maths to a high degree at high school, uh, although I'm quite capable of creating code with uh, quite advanced <laughs> algebra in it. So, yes, um, some news this week just before we get into the demo. Um, so Cly Sinclair, who invented the ZX Spectrum, the ZX81, the C5. If you've never seen a C5 because you're not in the UK, this was a sort of crazy, um, it looks like a little train or a little shoe. Um, that you sit in and it's an electric vehicle and he invented this um, like 30 years ago or something it's insane uh, and it really didn't take off there was a, a famous photograph of like a, a heavy goods vehicle and then this tiny little thing which was um, it's like an incumbent bicycle you kind of sat on it with the, your your hand your handlebar was underneath your feet it's very odd just google uh, c5 and you'll you'll find out what i'm talking about but this was my very first computer. This is what got me into programming. So I had the exact same rubber key 48K Spectrum, not the 16 version, I had the 48K version. Um, it was actually my brother who had this and I inherited it later on. And then we upgraded it from the rubber key version to a much better quality keyboard, um, just using like an upgrade kit. And that featured like a reset button on the side as well. Otherwise you have to sort of just pull the power out. And these things connected to um, a cassette recorder, you plugged in the microphone and the ears, um, earphone socket uh, and that you could play and record onto a cassette tape uh, so programs took ages to load it could take like five to ten minutes for a program to load on one of these the board rate was ridiculously slow um, but um, yeah you it, it got you into computing it was one of the things you could run actual code on so um, we used to buy magazines with code listings in and would sit there religiously typing them out and sometimes the print wasn't great and uh, you would find that um, you'd type something wrong and the code wouldn't work so you'd have to debug the code um, so that, that was a great introduction to, to sort of spaghetti programming. 
So yes, that was uh, something I just wanted to share with you. It's a shame um, uh, that, that he died. He was just one of those very influential people, uh, but he got an OBE for his uh, his contributions. There's a really good show called Micro Men, if uh, you want to try and catch that. I'm not sure if it's on Netflix or anywhere else online, but I think the BBC did a program on it a while ago, and it's got um, Martin Freeman in it, I think, as um, Tim Curry, who's one of the people that was fundamental in, in uh, creating um, the ARM processor and um, the BBC master computer which I have uh, one behind me just there so he, he went and spun off uh, Acorn computing uh, after falling out with Sir Clive at one point so I just wanted to call that out um, so time for a demo so 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 let me get over to um, my demo code and this is uh, running Google Colab so let me just uh, get over to there and what I will do if I go to, there we go. Okay, so what I've done here is um, I'm running Google Colab, colab.research.google.com. And you can write MicroPython or Python code in this. Uh, what I'll do, I'll just get rid of my, uh, before I get rid of my buy me a coffee thing, if you want to help support the show, you can go over to buy me a coffee slash Kevin McAleer. And if you want to buy me a coffee for all my hard work and brain melting stuff, creating this stuff, then you can do that. You can uh, buy me a coffee or, or two or three and you can help pay for the show. All the equipment that we have to buy, all the cameras, microphones, royalty free music, graphic software, streaming software and so on and so on and so on. Um, not charging you anything for this stuff so if you want to help out the show you can do that so that means i can turn off that little sign now and we can go back over to our code okay so i've written this um google colab sheet and what's great is you can have like these little text um if i double click in that it's a markdown code so you can have like a little hash and that means like heading one you can have uh, star 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 and that means bold and three little dashes means underline and so on and uh, you can even type in, um, so on my slides, wherever you saw that maths notation, this is called latex. And it's a, a way of writing out formulas uh, in code so that they display correctly like so. So I had a lot of fun learning latex. Okay, so let's get over to the uh, to the library code. I will read some of these bad jokes that are going on. There's loads of uh, Pythagorean jokes going on in the, uh, the message area. Right, so the first thing we're going to do, um, so we've got these little cells that we can run individually. So if I click on that little button there, we'll get a little tick next to it. It says it took zero seconds to run. So it's actually run that piece of code and then stopped. And this is what I like about Google Colab. We can write code, we can test it out and see what happens. If we get something wrong, we can tweak it and run it again. But only from that point, everything that ran before that point is still valid. So we don't have to run the entire thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up some constants. So instead of using A1 and A2, I'm going to use L1 and L2 because that's what um, we had in the code for uh, the Tico robot. And the lengths of these, these uh, arms, so that one is 55.1 millimeters and this one here, which is two, is 35 millimeters. And then we have um, X and Y. Now, what I want to show you, I've got um, I've got a printout here, but I can actually show you a more interactive version of this. Let me just head over to Autodesk Fusion 360. So I've got uh, a model here of the uh, the robot. Um, I can show you this um, in 3D, so we can spin over there. We've got the um, the two servos, and you can also see the angles of all the servos, so we can test our homework uh, once we've done this. So simply what I've done here is I've I've gone to the top view, I've moved the uh, the servos to uh, I don't know about there and then let's just move that over so that's about ninety and that's about about there. I think that's what I had it set as, and what I did then is I printed out a version of this, um, so that's you can see there with all the measurements on. And we have uh, the canvas, which the robot actually writes on. So if I just show you the, the real world version of that, you can see all the ink everywhere that's gone over this. This surface here is the canvas, and this is the uh, end effector, and there's our two servos there. Um, so let's get back over to, to Fusion. And then simply what I've done in Fusion is I've, um, you, can, you can create a drawing from this. And if I just zoom out on that, you can then set what all the dimensions are onto a piece of paper. Um, just so that you can figure out this. So that's exactly what I printed out there. Um, I've got a piece of paper there, which 
has that exact drawing on it. So I can save that as a PDF. If anybody's interested in that, I can uh, I can send you a copy as well. I can share the uh, the robot as well if anybody's interested in that too as a Fusion 360 file. Okay, so let's get back over to our code. Let me just uh, bring that back up. Okay, so X and Y. So you'll see there, X is actually a minus number. And that's because where our canvas is, the pen is ever so slightly over the side of the canvas. Um, and this is from the coordinates of the origin, which is the very corner there. So uh, again, if I just go back over here, so the, it's best to point this out. So this corner here, this corner here is our origin point and the servos are offset from that and inset from that. And where I had the, oops, where I have the um, the X and Y um, and the servos, you can see there, that's why that's minus one. So it's ever so slightly off the edge of the um, the canvas. I think that's somebody buying me a coffee, that sound, that can, that, that can only mean that. So thank you for whoever has just done that. Uh, I will, I'll check it and, and uh, get in touch. And O1X and O1Y is the origin point of the servo that we're actually using on this code. So this code isn't actually using both servos, it's just looking at one just for simplicity. And what I've said there is if the value of the, the number that for X or Y is a negative number, uh, we simply just want to flip the sign on that to make it positive. And the way that we do that is just multiply it by minus one. So if X is like, as it is here, minus one, multiplying that by minus one will make it a positive number and similar with y because we want to add to that uh, to figure out our global coordinates so let's translate the x and y into the same frame of reference as the servo so we need to basically add whatever is there to the distance between the servos x and y so that's simply what we're doing there we're seeing the global x is x plus the origin point uh, of the servo x and global y is the y value of the uh, coordinate system plus the offset of the servo y position so let's just run that block of code did we run that one we didn't so let's just run that that means that all our constants are now loaded we can now run this piece we're not printing anything out so we're not going to get any feedback just yet so you can see there there's our coordinate system there's our triangle that we're going to work out in a second we're going to work out what the r value is there's our l1 and an l2 arm and we're going to create a triangle now. So this is our first triangle solving function. So we're simply going to pass in X and Y, which is the end point. Um, they're both going to be floating point numbers um, and it will return a floating point number. So that's what that arrow there means. So it returns the value of the hypotenuse, which is this long side here. And so we say R is the square root of X uh, squared plus Y squared. So remember back in those slides, that's the first thing we want to do. And we simply return that value R uh, from that triangle one. So if we want to run that as a test, um, I always think a quick way, if you remember when you did maths at school, um, one of the right angle triangles that you could draw was a three, four, five triangle. So um, one of the sides was three, one of the sides was four, and then the long side, the hypotenuse was five. So I've fed in three and four, and in fact, I've got out five. So we know that that function's working and will give us that uh, long side that we need. So the next triangle we're going to work out, triangle number two, uh, we're going to feed in X and Y, and then we're also going to feed in that new value of R that we've passed in. So it's going to find the value of alpha, that angle between the two arms there. So alpha equals the acos, acos which is the arc tangent, sorry, the um, arc cosine of length um, arm L1 squared plus L2 squared minus uh, R squared. And then divide that by two times l times l l one times l two, um, so that's that uh, cosine rule. And we return um, pi minus alpha, and that's in radians. So this is one of the things as well that um, when I bought the little book on trigonometry that I was reading earlier, um, I never understood what radians were. So who invented three hundred and sixty degrees in a tri in a in a circle? Why is there three hundred and sixty degrees like in an entire circle? Why is that the best method? So some of the mathematicians thought, well, why don't we come up with our own method? And we, they came up with radians. So a radian is the length of the radius as, as the value one, and everything else is related to that. So when we do pi minus alpha, we actually get that value back in radians. So we'll convert that to degrees later on. That's very easy to do. 
So triangle number three, we're simply going to work out what the, um, the value of that A2 sin Q2, which is that imaginary line when it goes off past there, we want to know what the length of that imaginary line is. So we simply say the square root of minus cos um, Q2 squared. And then we simply return that value. Again, that's in radians. Uh, the fourth triangle is going to be the area of the angle beta, which we're interested in. So a beta is the arctangent of L2, uh, the sine of uh, Q2, times the sine of Q2, and then at length 1, length 2, which is both of the arms, times the cosine of Q2. And that returns beta, again in radians. So we're going to print out the results of all these things that we've just run. So what we're going to do is we're going to say R, which... Remember that, that long hypotenuse length, that equals the triangle one. So let's run this code. Uh, we're gonna print out triangle one, R equals uh, whatever it is in millimeters. We're then gonna say Q2, and we're gonna round that. Um, so instead of it being like a loads and loads of floating point numbers, we're simply gonna round that to the nearest um, one decimal place. Sorry, just eating some ice. I don't know why I decided to do that mid-flow. So yeah, we're going to run the uh, the results of that triangle 2, which we're passing global x, global y, and r. And we want one decimal place. So we're going to print out that in radians. And then we're going to work out what that Q2 value is in degrees. So simply to work out degrees, we, we say 180 divided by pi. So we just times it by 180 divided by pi. Uh, and that will give us the degrees. And then we simply print out that as degrees. And then we say alpha, beta, and gamma, and we just have triangles three, four, and the results gamma is just um, the arctangent of x of uh, and y, uh, and that will give us what that value is. And then we're going to work out what alpha, beta, and um, gamma are in degrees. So we simply just take each one of them and times it by 180 divided by pi, and we round it to one decimal place. And then finally we say alpha is this in degrees, beta is that in degrees, and gamma is that in degrees. And Q1 is beta minus gamma. And then we're going to work out what that is in degrees. So here we go. So R is 60, 60.12. So let's go back to our uh, diagram and see what it says on there. 60.12, 60 there we go. So we've got that length correct. Let's go back to our code. Uh, triangle 2 works out what Q2 is, so it's 1.7 radians, which is 97.4 degrees. Um, alpha is 57 degrees, beta is 34 degrees, and gamma is 85.9 degrees. And that means that Q1 is minus 0 0.9 degrees. So if we go back to our diagram, we can see that if I zoom right in, these oops, oh, I zoom right in then and then stopped. Let's go back to that. I just want to show you that that you can see uh, that there is a difference. So this line here and this line here, they coincide at the the origin of the servo, but then they go out and they start to separate. And the amount that they separate by is 0 0.9 degrees. So that's how we work out the inverse kinematics and therefore we can set the angle of our servo. The other thing we need to think about as well when we're setting our servos is wh where they're positioned. So it might be easier to show you this in a couple of ways. So I've got a diagram here that I've been working on and the servos are these, these things here and these little arcs that I've drawn around them are their zero position to their 180 deg degree position. So right in the middle is 90 degrees. Austin PS, thank you for subscribing to the channel. Really appreciate that. And uh, over here, you can see there that we have um, the two servos and these are not positioned at 90 degrees. So when you set this thing up, you actually position it, I think, 140 and 130 degrees. Uh, and that's because when these things move around, and it's probably easier for me to show you that in fusion uh, in the actual model, when we move these around, if I want to go to that very bottom point there, look at where the, the angle of this is positioned. So this is, a, it says 50 degrees there. When I move to the very top there, that's going to go to minus 30. When I go over here, it's going to 130, I think it is, when you get that just right. Uh, there we go, 130. And then similarly, this one over here, when this one goes to the very extreme over here, it's going from about minus 40 
Uh, let's try and get it to an extreme to about 90, 100 degrees. So that means that we can't have them at, um, from at zero to 180. We need to offset them slightly. And that's where these sort of fudge factor offsets come into play. So um, now the other thing that's a bit complicated about this, uh, and this is why I've not included it in the show so far. We worked out the uh, how to set this angle here in this servo. Um, and that end effector there, there's actually an imaginary line because that is one piece of plastic. So this one piece of plastic here, I'll just go to our overhead and just show you this a bit better. This one piece of plastic here, um, it's all one piece. So there is actually an imaginary sort of angle between the, the point where the pen goes in there and this, this point here, they're related. So even though it goes out there, um, the line length that we're really interested in there, that 55.1 is that length there. Not this length, not this length here, but the sort of length to the end point there. If that makes sense. <laughs> so if we then want to work out what the angle of this is, we're not actually looking at the end point. We're looking at this point here. So this is kind of offset from that. And this is only pivoted around that point there. So the angle between this here, which is L3 and L4, which is this one, changes depending where the pen is. So that's another set of triangles. Now we know the length of that, we know the length of that, therefore we can probably figure it out what the length of that's going to be and therefore what the angle of these other things need to be using our inverse kinematics. So I will work that out, put that into the code and share that out um, and just try and make it a little bit more easier to read rather than using direct uh, pulse widths into the servo and just use angles instead. And like I said, this will become quite useful for a future robot because we're going to use this in this kind of orientation. Uh, so if I just get rid of our canvas for a second. Uh, so this will be the foot and it'll be able to sort of walk like that uh, in that kind of motion. And that means that we can make it a, a much more interesting walking, you know, cycle um, than just having this thing um, as other robots do, just sort of have one thing that's moving across all the time. If that makes sense to you. Okay, so let me just have a look across at the uh, the comments that people have made. Um, so if you haven't commented already and you want to sort of be included in the show, feel free to start hitting the comments now and I'll just rewind back to the very beginning and see what people have been talking about. So Uday was saying that nice camera setup. So yes, I've got this, uh, this sort of how many cameras is that? Five cameras going on. So we've got the main host camera there. We have a GoPro over here. Um, so you can sort of see the desk. We have the old overhead camera, which is up here. You can see on the right hand side there, sort of looking down at the desk. There's the camera that's behind me, um, which is on an arm. So I've got a second desk there. I've got two desks and I can point that wherever I want to be. And then we've got the brand new um, overhead camera here as well. So that's a nice Sony. And what's great about that is if you have a I don't know, a component like this and you sort of hold it up, uh, it can sort of zoom in automatically using this sort of product mode. Um, so you can see there it's it's focusing very quickly without me having to sort of worry about that. So you get a nice clean shot of that. Um, I think that's all the cameras, isn't it? So yes, uh, that's the, the camera setup that we have. And uh, Richard will say no choking. I'm trying my best. I've got my drink. I've got uh, some orange. I think it's... Um, oranges it's um it's innocent mango passion fruit and apples my favorite i do have a sweet tooth um so let's have a look so hybotics is saying hey dale so he's from california so i came i break my brain today it certainly broke my brain i watched quite a few videos on this uh, a lot of them were like quite academic some of them were um not um very easy to follow and i thought i'm gonna have a go at this and by doing this, I'll be able to figure it out in future and understand it because it's just one of them where you've got these cosines and arc tangents and everything. It's all very like, so I thought, let's go back to basics, start with some Pythagoras and sort of work forward from there. So um, if it went a bit fast, just go back in the video, take your time through it and uh, just try and get each step nailed in your brain. So that's why I use that uh, Google Colab because I could write bits of code without having to run it on an actual piece of hardware and just uh, make sure my understanding step by step, which is why I did all those different four or five triangles, um, because it's really just two lines of code. But to get there, you need to understand all that. 
So, uh, Dale's feeling a bit down today. Oh, dear. I hope you're feeling better there. And uh, Fernando's saying, uh, damn, Kevin, I'm just a mechanic. <laughs> yeah, you've got a better idea about these things than most in, if you're a mechanic. Um, your cosine rule is really the law of cosine. That's that's true. I call it the cosine rule. It's the law of cosine. Tyrone is absolutely right there. And I, I knew as I was writing this that people would correct me, and I don't mind that. I like people correcting me because it means we all get to learn. <laughs> Uh, and Barty likes uh, brain smashed there. So Richard was saying at the beginning, every time I say the word angle, you've got to take a shot. <laughs> so, uh, yes, go for it. Uh, Facebook user um, says, this is fantastic. Wish I had more time to watch and learn. But you can always go back and watch again. It's recorded on Facebook and YouTube forever. So the law of sign might be useful here as well, especially if you don't have right triangles. That's true. Um, and uh, Richard was saying, Arr. 